Yeah, yeah, I think it works. Okay, so we're gonna do only the first exam today and we'll do the other two exams tomorrow because it's already so late. But the first exam is really good because it, tell, it pretty much, it looks just like the other exams. Pretty much the exact same concepts is covered. So exact same concepts pretty much, just kind of brought out a bit differently. Do you think of exam one as the easy one and then it gets kind of harder with exam two and exam three becomes easy again. So exam two is the only one. But oops, sure, let's do this. Okay, first up is functional groups. So, you guys remember your functional groups yet? Yeah, if you haven't have you, have you, have you, have you memorized your functional groups yet, flashcards, flashcards, flashcards are the best way to get it done as quick as possible. He's gonna heavily test this concept on the exam, which is good because it's easy points. The reason being is because April Height, the main bio biochemistry te lab teacher and kind of lecture teacher right now, is kind of upset that, that a lot of students are coming into her class not understanding functional groups. So Grubbs, like Grubbs was told by higher ups that he needs to start teaching functional groups. So he's testing it on purpose. Make sense? Yeah. Anyone know what that guy is? Nope. Aldehyde. The reason it's an aldehyde is because coming off of that guy is an H. Ketones have to be in between two carbons. No H's can attach to that. This is a ketone. Does that make sense? So ketones can only ever be secondary carbons, right? You probably don't know what secondary primary means. Let's talk about that real quick. Because I know he did probably didn't talk about that too much. So let's do that. Yeah, you guys see this little carbon chain I drew? You see those three color carbons, right? The red ones are called terminal carbons or primary carbons. They're called primary carbons because they are at the end of the molecule and they're only bond to one other carbon. Make sense? Purple are secondary carbons because they are bonded to two carbons. Tertiary carbons are called tertiary carbons because they are bonded to three carbons. Does that make sense? Uh oh, I'm gonna use messages. Okay. Okay. So when I say that aldehydes can only ever exist on terminary carbons, what I mean is, is since they are a double bond with an H coming off of it they need to exist on the red carbons only, right? Does that make sense? Well, ketones have to exist on the secondary carbons because they have to be flanked by two other carbons. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Okay. And that's the easy way to tell the difference between ketones and aldehydes. This guy might pop up too. Anyone know what this guy right here is? Carboxylic acid, right? It is basically an aldehyde minus the H and you replace it with an al alcohol group. That makes sense? Yeah. So what this is, is the ketone is actually gonna be number three. That's your ketone. Your aldehyde is number one and number two is your alcohol group. Does that make sense? Easy five points that's on your exam. That's good. Yep. It can be a primary, secondary, or tertiary. Does not matter. OH. Yep. As long as it's as long as it's its only thing bond to that carbon, besides other carbons, it's an alcohol group. Yes. Yep. What's up? It should be. It should be able to do the exams too. 
the exam should count too, because they are problems. No, it shouldn't, it shouldn't have to. I think this would work. Okay, so number two is a tricky way of doing it. This might also pop in your test because it's asking to draw isomers with a ketone. What's a ketone? R, C, R, y'all wanted O. Get that? Make sense? Knowing that. One, two, three, four, five. Our first ketone should become parent. Right? Is your first ketone. One, two, three, four, five. It should have three H's on it. Sorry, three H's on a carbon, normal carbon, two on there. Count those together. That's about 10 hydrogen each, right? Three, six, four is 10. With a ketone, there is our one. Make sense? Second one. One, two, three, four, five. Well, if I put the ketone on the second carbon, I can still put it on the third carbon, right? And I still get the exact same thing. I just moved over one, right? There is your second isomer. Does that make sense? Yes or no? You look lost. So here's your first isomer red, right? Ketone is on the second carbon, right? One, two. So I was just circling the, car the hydrogen. So they got complaints that I don't talk about hydrogen now. So one, two, three, one, two, three. So I just moved it over one and that's technically a different isomer, right? Because it would have a different name. Yep. Lastly, I believe it looks weird, but it does work, is if I draw a branch coming off of you, and then I draw it on that one. And there we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that is your third isomer. Does that make sense? Knowing what a ketone is may draw that molecule much, much easier. Does that make sense to everyone? Zoomies? And I had a question. What? Can I couldn't hear you mumble. Uh, sorry. Um, so why couldn't you move the oxygen over to like the fourth carbon when you made the five carbon chain? So what happened is if I moved it over to the fourth carbon, it would look like this. One, two, three, four, five, right? This is just the red carbon flipped around. Okay. Right. You gotta, make, you gotta be very careful not make, make mirror images of each other. That makes sense. Thanks. Yep. That's why you can't do that. You be very, very careful in your images. So the answer is three. Yeah. Any questions on this one? Yeah. SPD bound to a secondary carbon. Yes. Because it requires a double bond, which is two bonds already. Right, and it has to have two R groups, so that has to be your two other carbons. What? I'm loud. Oh, don't make, don't blow up. Yeah. An atom with a negative charge. What parameter is generally most important for that determining its relative basicity? So. If I have a negatively charged ion, right? What does that mean? Extra electrons, right? Cool. Is that an acid or a base? Why? Well, yes, yeah, so I went over that with you already. Everyone else does it. 
exactly. So the, what's going on is you guys had 115, we talked about Bronsted Lowry acids and bases, all right? That was the exchange of hydrogen. That does not occur in organic chemistry. Instead, we talk about Lewis, right? Lewis acid and Lewis bases. And they like electrons. So if in this general reaction right here, right? One guy's positive, one guy's negative, and they usually form a bond between each other, right? That's what's special about them. Okay. That negative right there means it has, it has a lone pair to donate, right? That positive means it's missing electrons, right? Correct? With Lewis acids, they want electrons, right? They are electrophiles or electrophilic. Electro means electrons, philic means love, right? So they love electrons, which would make the acid always positive. So electrophile always is the positive one. Make sense? Because they want the electrons. The base would be negative and that'd be the nucleophile. The reason they are a nucleophile is because they don't care about their electron shell, they care about their core nucleus, right? So they will give their electrons up to form that bond. And that is the process of a Lewis acid, Lewis base, nucleophilic, electrophilic substitution, reaction, combination reaction. That's the premise of all acid base in organic chemistry. Does that make sense? If, if it's negative, it automatically is the base and it automatically is the nucleophile. If it is positive, it's automatically electrophile and it is the acid. So this is the base. This is the acid. Yes. Uh, the problem is the question is the word always. Yes, it says the word always is the wrong thing for chemistry. It's always exceptions to the rules, right? If you have like a really, really strong Lewis, ba uh, Lewis base and a really, really, like a, and a really weak Lewis base, right? The weak Lewis base will act like an acid, right? You have two negatives and one will have to act like a positive, right? So it's not always true, but it's generally true. So you can, if, you, if you're in doubt, you can just follow that rule. That's fine. That makes sense? Yes. Yes, exactly. 95% of the time. Okay, so we are dealing with things that are negative, right? So, so what type of thing is most generally uh, uh, related to basicity? What thing is generally related to acidity, right? because they are the same concept, just reverse, right? So let's talk about some strong, let's talk about some acids. What are these guys right here? Halogens, right? Correct? Well, if I have an H next to them, they're strong acids, both Lewis-wise and both uh, bronsted lowry wise correct? But they're not all created equally, correct? Which one's which one's the weakest acid up there? HF. HF is the weakest acid. HI is the strongest acid. Right? There's a difference. Yes. Even though the minus, yeah, there's a, there's a difference, right? Because they're not the same atom. Things change about them, right? So what what's the difference between them? We go, we go up here our table of elements. Which one's which one's the smallest one? Fluorine is the smallest, right? 
Yes, it, that also plays in thing too. Most electronegative, yep. That does play a role, but they're all in the same column, right? So they pretty much are the same electronegativity because they're all in the same column. Pretty much same, right? So the size matters more, a bit more, right? So what I'm trying to get at is it's going to depend on the electron itself, the type of atom the, bond, the negative sign is bonded to. That's more important than anything else, right? That's more important than resonance structure. That's more important than hybridization. That's more important than inductive effects. Yes. Yep. Right. They are all technically, they all play a role in, um, in how determining elasticity and basicity, but it's the type of atom you always look for first, right? Because if I have that hydrogen right here, right? Cool. But if I have that hydrogen right here, correct? This hydrogen is way more acidic because it's bonded to a fluorine molecule, theoretically speaking, right? That makes it way more acidic than anything else. That's pretty much what we're trying to get at. Zoom, does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. Cool. Now we got to look at basicity and how things play. So, which one's the most basic? Which one's the least basic? You would think, right? You would think that this one's the most basic. What tells you that? Strong base, right? Your Chem 115 uh, brains are firing, right? This is not Chem 115. That's where Bronze said Lowry, right? This is Lewis. So it's not that one. The strongest actually is this one right here. The reason being this nitrogen has two lone pairs, right? How happy is it? It's not happy. It only needs one bond, right? And then it's happy, correct? So it's gonna do anything it can to get rid of those electrons to become happy, theoretically speaking, correct? Right? Will it bond with carbon? Yeah, right. Will it bond with hydrogen? It will bond with sulfur. It will bond with phosphorus. It will bond with another a nitrogen, if it, another hydrogen if it wants to. It can bond to any of those molecules, correct? And it will do that as readily as possible. That's why it's the most basic, because it's the most reactive right now. OH only has two options. It's going to bond to a carbon or a hydrogen, right? Those are two options. And that's it. Since, since this NH right here, NH2, has more options to bond to, it's more basic, right? Because it's more ready to do anything it needs to to become happy. What else can oxygen bond to? The thing share, share, be, be kind of happy with. What else can it bond to? It's so much more electronegative than everything else. It won't bond exactly well, right? It can't bond to their oxygen because then that's not going to work out, right? Because the oxygen, are, it's going to want to do a, it's going to want to do a double bond in oxygen, right? So it's going to kick off the hydrogen, and that's not going to work. That's making it acidic, not basic. Can I come to what I'm saying? Yes or no? Okay. If not, you can ask me. You can say no. Okay. That's but it is actually the middle basic because it, it's still a strong, it's still a strong base, right? It's just not the strongest. And lastly, this guy right here, who's already happy, he's not going to want to do anything, right? Is the least basic. I know the numbering doesn't make sense, but that's how it works out. If you look at the numbering, most basic, uh, sorry, least basic, middle basic, uh, most basic.
why, why is this one right here? And ain't this the least, right? Because yeah. it's already bonded to a carbon, right? How close to the PR table is this? These two guys together with each other. They're pretty close, right? They're right next to each other. But what electronegativity is pretty much the same. There is a little dipole movement going to nitrogen. It's not enough without a certain without knowing a certain solution what it adds in to break that bond fully, right? Because that bond is going to break. There's two electrons up to play, right? Both carbon and nitrogen can equal, almost equally fight for both those electrons. Make sense? So there, why would nitrogen break up, break up if it can't get both electrons? It's going to lose. It's going to lose basically in that breakup. And what it's going to then what it would gain staying with carbon. That makes sense. I'm just hypo. Well, it's because it's right here. Oh no, that's that's different. I already talked about that. Yes. Yes. It wants it wants to become happy. Yes. 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 Those are the conjugate. Those are the so they were acids. Right, they became conjugate bases. So that's yes, yes. Hey Shane. Yeah. Can you explain why NaOH is the middle again? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So NaOH, your your Chem one fifteen signals are going off. It's a trick question. It's a trap. General Akbar, right? Oxygen wants to form one more bond, right? What can it form a bond with and still win out in the end? There's only two options it can, it can do that with, right? And that is carbon and hydrogen, right? Not, you really don't normally see uh, ni uh, a nitrogen with an alcohol group. The reason being is this is a toxic relationship, right? Think about your friends, you know, it's a bad, you know, it's a bad relationship, but they're going to happen anyway, because you know it's going to break up the next week, right? When this occurs, oxygen is going to pull the electrons away and run away, right? And it's going to devastate nitrogen. That's going to happen, right? So that can occur. So the only two options for oxygen to do really is to do that. So if oxygen bonds with an oxygen, it's going to do a, do a, do a double bond and both be happy and never going to want to react ever again because that's what oxygen is in the air, right? So that oxygen only has two choices compared to this nitrogen, which can bond to hydrogen, which can bond to carbon, which can bond to sulfur and phosphorus and a whole bunch of other things. It has more options to bond, right? So it's ready to go mingle way more, thus it's more base, basic. Make sense, Emily? Yeah, thank you. Of course. We all good in that one? It's weird. It's probably one of the hardest ones on here, but that's what it's basically saying. Yeah. Now let's talk about arrows because a lot of you guys don't like arrows. What do arrows signify? So arrows signal the movement of electrons, right? So only the movement of electrons. So going back to my AB example, right? A is negative, B is positive. Which one has lone pairs, A or B? A. So you should always start your arrows from the nucleophile. And it should always go towards the electrophile. Make sense? Arrows go from nucleophile to electrophile. Okay. So let's look at one, two, three, and four. 
So let's start off with three. What's wrong with three? It's going from the electrophile to the nucleophile, right? It's a no-no. If it was the other way around, that could work in theory, right? So that one is wrong because it's the opposite way around, right? Okay. Bromine. Bromine, chlorine, iodine, and sometimes fluorine are all halogens. They are all super electronegative, right? They are called leaving groups. They will always leave, right? Because what do they want? They want one more electron to be happy, right? So they will literally break bond, they will form bonds just to break bonds, to have a lone pair, to become happy. Does that make sense? So anytime you see a bromine, a bromine, fluorine, iodine, and sometimes fluorine, or even sometimes fluorine just depends on the solution, right? They, you should always have an arrow going away from them, right? For example, the arrow should be going towards the bromine, right? The arrow should be going towards the bromine because it's gonna break the bond to steal that bond. Because it's, it's better for bromine to break a bond, have a full valence shell than to be in a bond by itself. Does that make sense? Four is wrong because what it's saying is carbon is more electronegative than bromine. Is that true? No. If you don't know, go look at a periodic table. Bromine is way closer to fluorine than carbon is because in the same column. Does that make sense? Yeah. Five is wrong because what's gonna happen is bromine leaves, right? Making that carbon positive, then that bond goes towards the positive, make it happy, right? Does that make sense? Because bromine always leaves, it's a leaving group, correct? Yeah, with five, what's wrong with five is it's saying that bromine stays and that bond breaks and goes to bond to a negative ion already. So there's two things wrong. First, bromine should be leaving. Bromine is not leaving. That's the first thing wrong. Second thing, why would a negative ion want more electrons? It's the exact opposite of what it wants, right? It doesn't want more, more electrons. It's already negative, correct? It wants to get rid of its electrons. That's why five is wrong. Now we're between one and two. Right? Hey, cool. We got a sulfur and it's bonding somewhere, right? That's moving electrons. That part's A okay. But is that the only arrow necessary for this reaction? Yes or no? No. We need a second arrow moving the double bond towards the oxygen, making it have. Oh, God. What's going on? making the oxygen have three lone pairs, right? Breaking one of those bonds, making that carbon positive, allowing that bond to form. Make sense? So one is halfway right. It doesn't have the other arrow. That's why one is wrong. The only one that has all the arrow necessary is number two. Because you can break that bond between oxygen and chlorine Oxygen's going to get the electrons, one because it's positive, and one because it's more electronegative, right? Thus making that happy. Does that make sense? You look confused. Well, the very first one? Yeah. The reason why it's positive is, here's, I'll draw the molecule down here so you can look at it better. How many bonds does this guy right here have? Okay. If I break one, how many bonds does it have now? Okay, three, right? Because it lost the bond. It lost electrons. What's its charge now? It lose electrons. Becomes positive. Yep. That's why that S is there, to give its electrons towards that positive, All right? What's wrong is it doesn't show, it doesn't show this part. It doesn't show the bond breaking.
if if I have the second part, oh God, I'm hearing myself twice. One sec. Happens when you drink. Don't drink, guys. Yeah, there we go. <sighs> I'm not drunk, I swear. I'm just one hour of sleep, which is the same thing as being drunk. Yeah. Let's do blue. Yeah. If I don't have this blue arrow, it's not 100% correct. One is a two arrow process, right? Me having one arrow is not enough. There we go. Yeah, zoomies, we good? Yes, it would be. A lot of these would be right if they weren't wrong. What was that sigh for? You? Yeah, that heavy sigh. Oh. Zoomies, we good? I'm gonna assume yes, because no one's yelling at me. Yes. Okay. Okay. Number six, we got some dipole movements going on. Woo woo. Okay. Oh. Now I drank some carbonated beverage. Okay. <sighs> if I could clone myself and pull, play tug of war with myself, could I ever win if I clone myself? Yes or no? No. I have cloned myself and I'm playing tug of war with these electrons right here. I can never win because I am playing tug of war with myself. There is no dipole movement because it's the same thing bonded to each other. Right? Make sense? Cool. So that's going to have the least amount of dipole movement because it's nonpolar pretty much. Right? That would not be the case if this were to occur. Oops, if I had an H here and I had a CH3. Because then I have the ability to do what? Resonance structure, right? Right, resonance structure messes dipole up. That makes sense? Let's look at number, let's look at the second one. Carbon, oxygen. Yeah. If I go to a kindergarten class and I go play tug of war with some kindergartners, can I win? Hydrogen is super small compared to everything else, right? Here's me, I'm carbon right here. So I can play, I can play tug of war with those kindergarten who's hydrogen, right? And I could win. There's a dipole movement towards the carbon, right? Because it's gonna have more of the electrons, right? The electrons are gonna hang out more towards the carbon between those two hydrogens. Doesn't that make some sense? Yes or no? Okay. <clears throat> if I got oxygen, which is way more, so think about like, I don't know, uh, Vin Diesel or The Rock, right? I'm gonna play tug of war with Vin Diesel or The Rock. He's gonna kick my ass, right? Even if I use two ropes, right? Those two ropes just means I'm pulling tug of war with two different people. I'm playing tug of war with Vin Diesel and The Rock at the same time, because those are two different bonds. Much bigger dipole movement, right? Towards that oxygen. Because those, those two bonds has how many electrons total? Two, that's four electrons, right? Those four electrons are gonna hang out way more towards the oxygen than the carbon, correct? Yes or no, that makes sense? So way more dipole movement occurs there, correct? Also, I got this dipole movement going on down here, right? That evens out because it's two different sides. So it doesn't matter too much. It's that dipole movement straight up and down that's the problem, right? Does that make sense? It isn't, well, they're only infinite because there's two of them. Okay. We're just talking, we're trying to talk about, we're talking about dipolements in general. They are insignificant, insignificant, right? But they do form a dipole movement. It's small, but it is a dipole movement. You can measure it. Okay, let's look at, let's look at the last one. Uh, 
Yeah. Again, here's me. I'm the I'm Carbon, right? Cool. Playing tug of war with a bunch of kindergartners, right? But these two are posing each other. They don't care too much. This one, oops, hi Nicole. That one cares, okay? And then dipole movement that way. How many electrons are in play here? Which one has the largest dipole movement? One with four electrons being pulled, or one with two electrons being pulled? Four, largest, middle. Does that make sense? On why dipole movements matter like that? Yes or no? Yes, that's, yes, that's, you can think about it that way to, to if my analogies don't work. So if you have a double bond, it has, it affects, and it does a way more better dipole movement because it's theoretically four electrons in play instead of just one, uh, two. Yes, no, maybe so. Uh, that's not in play here, they're all linear. Because it's all it's all one carbon. Angles are coming to play next unit, really. Next unit, because all next unit is is the wedges and the dashes and uh, chirality and you have Newman projection and all this really annoying stuff. Right now, if you notice, it's all linear, so that's all that matters. He's just trying to test the concept of do you know double bond means more dipole. Yep. Hi, Nicole. You didn't, you're not too late. You're good. I'm recording this. I'll post it later so you can be able to follow ahead. Okay. Assisty. Now we're ranking assisty. Uh, assisty. Okay. So, assisty is depending on what it's bonded to, right? And there's something else that's very important to it. Go back to that one question, number three. It says that resonance is very important to assisticity as well, right? Because if you can make a, you can make a molecule negative or make a, make, make a molecule positive or negative, it will leave depending on which one, correct? So which one can you, which one has resonance structure? One, two, or three? All of them. Trick question. They all have resonance structures. All right? If that can go up here, that could go here, that could go up here, that could go down there, that could go up here, that could go up here, that could go down here, which can go down here, which can go down here, right? So which one has the most resonance structures? The last one. Thus, it is the most acidic. More resonance structures, more acidic. I believe in your in your PowerPoints, right? He goes over this exact concept. And the example is, I believe it's something, it's this exact thing. It's uh it's methanol. No, it's it's ethanol, right? And then you have one that's just remember exactly what it is, right? But it's something else, aldehyde or something like that, right? And this right here is like a 7.5, which is a, which is a medium acid. And this all is what it drops all the way down to like a net one negative 1.1 because we have one more resonance structure, right? So going from two resonance to one resonance is a huge deal, right? So resonance play a big deal inside uh, make it acidic and vice versa, right? So the least amount of resonance structures makes something more basic. Does that make sense? Because it's the exact opposite for each other. Uh... Well, that's Bronsted Lowry. What's the other way? What's Lewis acid definition? 
it wants an, it, it wants the form of bond, right? Right? Or it wants, yeah, that's pretty much it. Because if if so, for example, if one of those oxygen become if one of those oxygen become negative through resonance, right? The S becomes positive, right? So technically there's more S characteristic, because they're not S characteristics, like that one I'm thinking of. There's more positive characteristics than the last one than any of the other ones. Make sense? There are positive, positive are electrophiles, which are acidic. Negative are base, right? But once you form a base, you technically form an acid in the same compound, right? If something comes negative, there has to be a positive pole as well, right? You can't just have a negative pole in the, of a molecule. If a molecule is nonpolar and you make it polar, it has to have two poles. It would be the weakest base. So yes, this would be the yes would be the weakest base. Okay, up next. But next, you have the exact same resonance structure, right? Correct? Yes or no? They have the same amount, right? They both can do two, right? So we can't use resonance structure anymore. What else can we do? You look at the atom bonded to it, right? Carbon is known for doing being what? Uh, Carbon is known for being pretty neutral, right? So it's not going to really amount, it's not going to affect acidity at all. Sulfur, on their hand, sulfur's crazy. Sulfur's out there, right? Sulfur will mess with negativity. That makes this guy middle, making this guy first, at least acidic. Yes, because it's more, it's more electronegative. Sulfur being more electronegative means it's going to pull electrons towards it, thus making the oxygen more pull, uh, more positive, thus making it more acidic in general. Does that make sense? Okay. What's more electronegative, carbon or sulfur? Sulfur. So, right? If I do this, this is more likely to happen right putting it, putting that bond there making this guy unhappy right i have a more i can have more chance of making positives with this structure than this structure does that make sense uh it's not so it won't pull electrons more it won't pull it won't pull it the same strength right but it'll put up a fight with it and that fight itself would make it acidic, right? Because in the off chance, it does win the fight against oxygen. Oxygen's not happy and it's gonna start freaking out. Okay. Well, Zoomies, that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All you guys sound so tired, jeez. How many arrows? Woo, woo. We're doing arrows. But it's nice because they give us what we're adding and they give us what we already will have to make. That's nice of him. He's, not, he's too nice this semester. Okay, we have this guy. We must make this guy. First off, what do you notice about the oxygen? What, what did it lose between one and two? It lost its double bond. So we're gonna break that bond, right? Does that make sense? Cool. What else do you notice? That? What, what do you notice about the, the double bond right here? It moved, right? So resonance structure occurred, correct? Okay. Lastly, what do you notice about this methyl group right here? What is its charge? So what do I want to make for it to bond to something? I want to make a, a positive. Because if there's a negative and a positive, they come together like glue. Okay. 
So here's what you do. You take this guy, resonance structure, move the bond over here. Doing so forces this bond to move towards the oxygen, giving it an extra set of lone pairs, right? Making it negative, right? It doesn't say it's negative, but technically it is negative, right? Okay. Since I broke this bond right here, what is the charge of this carbon right there? At the very end. It positive because it lost the bond, right? I broke a double bond, it lost electrons. It is positive now. Hey, here's this negative. Bada bing, bada boom. Do you see that? Yes or no? You, some of you guys, you mean faces? I can't see some of your faces, but I can, or I can feel your faces freaking out. So let's get big. That's why, that's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm zooming up. There we go. There we go. Right. That guy becomes positive. These go here. How many arrows did I already draw? The first answer is four. We're not even done yet. We're only in step one. So most likely four is not the right answer. Right? Make sense? It could be, but most likely not. Zoom out. Yeah. Already used three, already, we already used three arrows. <clears throat> so three arrows are done. Okay, I have this molecule now. It's kind of slightly negative. Cool. Oh God, I have an email. Okay. So I am making, I'm going from molecule two to molecule three. What did you guys, what do you guys see with the oxygen? What happened to the oxygen? It got its double bond back, right? So what am I, what am I doing with that negative symbol? Move it down there, right? Do you see that? What happened to this double bond right here? Is it there anymore? So most likely it became electrons onto that carbon. The reason I'm saying that is because what do I have here? Those oxygens right there, right? Correct? Look at this guy right here. Got positive oxygen, right? How do I do that? How do I break that? How do I fix that? I, I gotta break the bonds, correct? Right? And technically, it steals those bonds right there. Steals the bonds from hydrogen. Yep, and, and then what happens is that becomes two hydrogens there, which makes that carbon happy now, right? Because it's neutral, because there's no more charge, and that's how you get rid of your charge. There you go. Because I made water, right? How do I go from this guy to this guy? What do I lose? I lost a hydrogen, right? So hydrogen has to attach to something, right? Does it attach to the oxygen? Yes or no? Nope, so I get attached to a carbon instead. That's what you do. So let's draw, let's erase the arrows I don't need. Yep, and the answer is six. Three on step one, three on step two. If you're confused, Here's why you're confused. Technically, one of the hydrogen will break its bond with oxygen, right? Doing that, we don't draw an arrow for that, right? The reason we don't draw an arrow for that is because we don't draw an arrow for the bond breaking of a hydrogen bond on a thing we add to a structure. That's just because we assume it happens, right? 
We don't have to draw an arrow for something we can assume. It's a stupid rule. I don't like it, I know, but that's what it is. Yep. But we don't we don't know we don't count the red arrow because it's a hydrogen. It's a hydrogen, right? It's a, it's a, it's the breaking of a hydrogen bond. We assume that it happens automatically, right? So we don't have to draw an arrow for that. Uh, you have to go look it up. So he probably told he probably gave it to a rule set of rules to you. That assumption is pretty much a rule because he does that throughout this entire key. Huh? Huh? He has it on the key? Where does he have it on the key? I don't believe you. Where? Oh, God. Did he do that really? I messed up. I hate him with those stupid arrows. Okay, good, good. Oh, you're right. He just assumes. He skipped this step. My bad. He skipped uh, that step. He summarized that step by doing that, which you could do. Okay. And then, and then that technically is going like that. So I guess you don't. Never mind. You do, I guess you do show the bonds of the breaking hydrogen. You just don't show the the uh, arrows to making lone pairs on a carbon. I guess. There's too many rolls of arrows and he like so annoying. Oh, I don't like I don't like arrow problems because sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. So between six and seven, I would choose six because it simplifies it. If it was me on a test, right? And it was like, could I do with one less arrow? Yes, I could. That's probably the answer. You could do with one less arrow. Because you do with you always try to do with the fewest arrows possible. Yeah. Yeah. Minus out. Aha. Come back to 115 question again. Nice. I love 115, don't you guys? You guys thought 115 was hard a semester ago. Would you rather take 115 again or camp? Oh, camp. Okay. Huh? Yeah, I know. Huh? That's great. Really? Okay. Well, at least math makes sense. There's rules to follow and it's not gross. Okay. Uh, I have this K equal Q greater than one. What does that mean? Come on guys. Products over reactants. K is equal to that, right? So which one wins? Products or reactants? Products wins, right? Make sense? So K equals, hopefully for 115 this remembers, but I beat this into your guys' head every single test. So this increases, this should decrease, making K greater than one, right? So I favor my products. So which side is which side is which side is more stable? This side or this side? The products are more stable, right? Cool. <clears throat> So the conjugate base of two butanol is weaker base due to resonance. Yes or no? No. What do you guys think? I think not. You think not? Why not? Um, because it's saying that the conjugate base, so meaning on the product side, is weaker due to resonance. Good job. You guys are still in your Bronsted Lowry mindset. We're in Lewis acid, Lewis bases. A stronger base is more stable. Does that make sense? A stronger base is more stable. You just told me products are more stable, right? Now, due to hybridization or due to resonance, which one matters more? Resonance matters more. That's why. Technically, we go from less stable to more stable. 
it's less stable because it reacts, correct? Does that make sense? It reacted, thus it is less stable. But say it. You guys are, I'm trying to break the mindset between Bronson Lowry and Lewis Acid. Because if, if this was a Lewis, sorry, if it was a Bronson Lowry, right? It would be, it is weaker due to resonance, right? Because the weaker base is more stable, correct? Yes. Yes. Because it's more stable. Also, going over here, what's that guy right there? Huh? Negative. What's that? Okay. Is that a base or an acid? What's that make this guy? Right? Is that pretty stable for an acid? Right? So that's probably a weak acid. That would be a strong base for its conjugate. Does that make more sense to you instead? Okay. There's two ways of thinking about it. Is the fact that, okay, this guy right here is negative, right? Which would make it be neutrophile. And neutrophile is mainly what? Great. Which would make this the? What would this be then? It's conjugate. Okay. I'm trying to I'm trying to teach you guys ways. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to work the problem over multiple ways so you guys understand it from multiple directions. Because depending how you define something, it changes its property. No. Yes, you can. The stable structure is usually stronger. Yes. As it not? Yep. Okay. Then do it this way if that's confusing, guys. Is this guy right here knowing knowing things from one fifteen? Is that a, is that a weak acid or a strong acid? How would you know that? Is it one of the is it one of the seven strong acids? It automatically is in what? Okay, weak acids have a what conjugate base? Strong or weak? Thus, it has to be one of the strong then. That makes sense. And it's strong because of it's strong because of resonance. If that makes more sense to you, do it that way. All right. If one fifteen makes more sense, do it that way. For Ochem, it just makes more sense that stronger things are more stable. Okay. Uh, this guy reacted. Correct. There is no reverse arrow, right? Yeah. Why is there no reverse arrow? Because that guy's happy, right? He won't react anymore. This guy right here is stable because of resonance. It's going to go back, right? It's going to go backwards and forwards, and backwards and forwards, and backwards and forwards because it's a true bond, right? That lone pair will push that bond there, which will push that bond there which will push that bond back and forth, back and forth repeatedly, nonstop, right? That stabilizes that structure. That structure is stable because of resonance and it's a strong base. Because strong things tend to be more stable. You can, that's one way of approaching it, right? That might make sense to know why you get rid of the weaker part, right? The resonance part comes from resonance because resonance is way more important than hybridization.
there's two ways of approaching the question depending on thinking about thinking about 115 way or OCAM way. Does it make sense? Okay. Zoom easy, good. Yes. Yes, okay. Sir. Let me make sure. I can't see your beautiful faces, so I can't read your faces. The people in the classroom are giving me these like looks of despair, so I can I know when they're uh, need help. Okay. Hey, look, more identification of functional groups. Do you guys think this will be on your exam? Intense, wink, wink. Well, then you're gonna lose about five to ten points. So do it. Okay. Here's how you do nitrile. It has a T in it. What's that T mean? Triple. Nitrile is a nitrogen with triple bond to a carbon. As a nitrile. Cool. Have an amide and a mean, right? This you have to know. An amide is a nitrogen bonded to whatever that is bonded to a carbon with a with basically bonded to a ketone, basically, right? Yes. Those are R's, so they could be nitrogen. But the fact that it is nitrogen doesn't make it a ketone anymore, it makes it an amide. It's because this guy right here is not a carbon, it changes the ketone to an amide because the nitrogen is way more important. That kind of makes some sense? What's more significantly important? The fact that carbon's here or the fact that there's a nitrogen? That nitrogen changes things, right? Because now that double now that double bond most likely is going to break towards that nitrogen, right? Because now it's going to fight between the oxygen and the nitrogen. If it's a, if it's a ketone with a nitrogen involved, right? It's automatically an amide. There you go. <clears throat> an amine is very annoying, but basically how you do an amine, it's an R group, so it's a carbon bonded to a nitrogen, and we put X two here because it could be anything. Carbons, hydrogens, whatever you want, other nitrogens, right? It has to have three bonds. It doesn't have to be a carbon. It be nit Because, right, this theoretically, if I draw in purple, right, that's an amine. That's an amine, right? Oops, that's my bad. Oops, too many. And that's an amine. Purple, green, and blue are all technically amines. As long as you have a nitrogen bond to a carbon and there was no oxygen involved, it's not a double bond, a single bond, it pretty much is an amine. Amine, sorry, amine. An amine has to occur with double bond to oxygen. To a carbon. Was it a hand raise or a stretch? Yes. It's got a T, means stroke on. Yep. Amide is a, uh, so an amide is this. Yeah, but it pretty much is, it's pretty much a double bond of oxygen right next to a nitrogen. Nope, it's just not, a, it's a weird looking amide. So it's amide, it's sorry, we're looking at me, amine, so it's amide. So you guys know what amine, what? I guess that works. Okay. 
Yay! We're going to molecular shapes. This one I don't really understand either. So I don't know how to really help this one. He didn't give an example. He just like gave an answer. Yep, there's only one thing I can think about why. Yeah. Yeah, be, yep, that's one reason why. And it's the textbook. So you guys should know everything in the textbook. It's how he thinks. I know. You guys help me helping you. That's why you got to read the textbook. I had to read the textbook. They're awful. Yeah. The answer is. Da, 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 da. This one. Here's the reason why I think it is. What does the wedge mean? Coming towards you, right? <clears throat> Trying to think of a school appropriate way. When you want to eat something, right? You want the biggest piece of food, correct? So that has to come towards you, right? When you don't want to eat something, you want the smallest piece going to someone else, right? So that goes away from you. If you look right here, bromine and this methyl group are pretty big, correct? Size-wise and weight-wise, mostly weight-wise, right? Does that make sense? Yes or no? Because bromine, the heavy molecule, if you don't believe me, go look at smaller mass. And then carbon is a carbon with three hydrogens. That weighs more than a fluorine does, right? So that means fluorine and hydrogen are smaller and they are way less, right? So they, those should be dashes. Smaller, lighter molecules should almost always be dashes. Dashes, like in the back. You want less junk in your trunk. Yes, it does. Look at A. Well, no, B, yeah, B is right because it's incorrect. Look for which one is incorrect. B is incorrect. Less junk in the trunk, right? Less junk in the trunk. Less junk in the trunk. I got a lot of junk in the trunk right there. I have my big, I have a big molecule going away, going uh, towards the back. That's not good. Why? It's more stable. If some, if for example, if I were to put a lot of weight between your forward part, you could lean back, right? But there's a lot of weight behind you. If you lean forward, they can fall, right? If leaning backwards, it also makes you fall, right? It's harder to balance it for molecules. That's why it's the wrong shape. That's the only reason I can think of. I don't know if that's the right reason, but it's the only reason I saw. It's the reason why I would pick B. It's because technically, you guys will learn this with, uh, you have to flip the entire molecule around. You really have to take it and flip it around. It's really annoying. So, are the biggest molecules, right? Yeah. They either have to be wedges, like in A, or at least one has to be a wedge and one has to be a normal bond. Right, like in C. As long as long as the biggest guys are not dashes, you're good. Yeah. That's one possibility, right? In which they're both going up and everything else going down. It's basically looking like this, and then this. These two are going down. That's what the molecule looks like. What C, what C, what B looks like is you have one going up, one kind of going behind, and then two coming out like that. It looks weird. So it just doesn't work out. If I, my, if, I, if, I have my, if I had my model kit, it would make way more sense. Your model kit with you? Okay. All good. We're gonna need it for the next exam and the next quiz. So if you haven't ordered a model, model, model kit yet, go on Amazon and do it as soon as possible. Because everywhere else, it's going to be exactly the same step as we are. So all Arizona's going to start ordering model kits at the exact same time. It's going to take forever.
don't want to compete with ASU for when they're buying model kits, trust me. Let me so. Well, yeah, because they have more people. Okay. Hey, God damn it, this MO thing is coming back. I hate this MO thing. That's true. If you wanted to, you're smart. You'd buy a whole bunch right now and sell it for extra money or rent them out to people. Make money back. Business. Okay. So which of the statements is true about molecular theory? According to molecular theory, ions are localized on a specific ion and specific atoms. Is that true? That's false. Why is that false? Because it's about things coming together and it's the bond in which they form together, right? It's the, it's the SP hybridization. This is hybridization. MO theory is hybridization. It's not specific molecules. It's two molecules together, two or more molecules together. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Yes. Yep. Okay. That's why that one's wrong. The linear combination of atomic orbitals, LACO method, is used to generate molecular orbitals for a molecule. That's true. Linear combination of atomic molecules. So what's combination? Two things added together, right? When two things add together, you can get the atomic orbitals of both of them, right? That is when you, for example, take oxygen on into a chlorine, right? You can get the hybridization of this chlorine right here. What's the hybridization of that chlorine? Is it? SP2. I taught you guys the easy way of doing that, not to use MO theory. But basically what, to, what B is saying is you add all the atoms together to figure it out, pretty much, right? Make sense? Yeah. I know it doesn't make sense, but that's what it is. So hint, hint, wink, wink. When, you come, when you're trying to study for a definition, look at this thing and just know the things I put uh, check marks to. And that's what it's trying to say. C is also right. The number of or molecular orbitals created from a LACO uh, uh, approach is identical to the number of atomic orbitals that were originally combined. I, I, so I have to add the uh, electrons of all the atoms connected together, and that's the number of electrons in the total system together, right? I add all the electrons of oxygen, all the electrons of carbon, and all the electrons of the other carbon, and that's the amount of electrons in play right now. Correct? That's what B is saying. Uh, what C is saying, right? Molecular order theory is a powerful bonding theory that accurately predicts the structure of complex molecules. Yes, that's the whole purpose of MO. That's why he tries to teach it to you guys because it can help predict things, right? You guys knew this was SP2, didn't you? Did MO theory theoretically work? Yes, this is MO theory. I just taught you how to skip it without using any math. That's MO theory. So it does work accurately. Okay. And lastly, you have bonding, antibonding, and non-bonding electrons in play. So there's your, there's your definition of MO theory and LACO. Just know that. Know those four definitions and you're pretty much good. You're pretty, pretty much set. Is it one of those four? Most likely it's wrong. That's why, well, even though 12 is really annoying, that's how you do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm gonna go a little bit quicker because this thing closes at 10, which is not fun. Benzyl penicillin or penicillin G is blah, 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 I don't care, right? It's giving you a bunch of information you don't need. Here's what you do need. So like statements that are true. Does that just have one aromatic ring? Yes, where's the aromatic ring? Benzene. 
Benzene ring is aromatic. So here, that's not aromatic. What's aromatic means benzene. There's one benzene. That is true. Right? Bada bing, bada boom. It has a heterocyclic ring. What does hetero mean? What does cyclic mean? Circle. So if I do this, that's a homocyclic ring because it's all the same molecules in a ring. If I were to do this, are they all the same molecule? Is that a heterocyclic ring? Do I have a heterocyclic ring? I have one. Where's the second ring? This guy? It's all carbons, hydrogens there. That's it. That's homo. Oh, the S. Where's the S? The S isn't. The S isn't. Oh, I guess right there. You're true. That is a ring. There is two. You could go. That is technically a ring. You're right. It's a pentagon. I have two amide. What's an amide? Let's see. Let's count. I got I got one right there, and I got one right there. Right? Bada bing, bada boom. Cool. And the structure shown: a carboxylic acid functional group is moving forward. So where's my carboxylic acid? What's carboxylic acid? Bottom thing. I got a thing down here. I'll circle it in purple. No, I want purple. I want purple. Now I got purple, good, good. It's not a wedge, it's a dash. It is not going towards the forward out of the plane. It's going into the plane, it's going into the page, right? So that is false. That's a no-no. There's a total of 10 lone pairs, not specifically shown in this molecule. Yep. Two, four, six. Huh? There is, I think there's two. So that's about eight, not 10. So that one is wrong. Nope. Uh, yes, there's two there too. I think actually there is two. Uh, there is none on sulfur. It's my bad. Technically, there is two there too. And then sulfur, because I think sulfur's happy. Or sulfur might have four. I think sulfur has four. I think I'll look it up again. Huh? What's the formal charge of sulfur? What is the formal charge of uh, sulfur? Oh no, don't, don't, don't update. Do not update, do not do that. Don't do that. Sulfur is right below oxygen, right? So that's no. So technically it's gonna have the exact same thing. It has two bonds. So we have two lone pairs. So two, four, six, eight, ten. That is true, right? There is 10 there. Yes. Sulfur is the exact same as oxygen. So there is 10. No, nitrogens. There's two, there's a lone pair in each of the nitrogens. Two. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there we go. So there are lone pairs in Yes. Yes. Yeah, there's way more because each of the nitrogen have one lone pair, each of the oxygen and sulfur have two lone pairs, right? All that together is way more than 10. Oh, hey guys, it's resonance again. Some of you guys love resonance. Some of you guys hate resonance. Okay, but, but, but they're easy. Well, this one is. I got a positive end. What's gonna happen? Break that, that guy goes there, right? 
I form a double bond there. That positive moves. Where does it move? To this guy. Because that guy lost his bond, right? He lost his double bond. So he now he's missing a bond. So now that goes there. Make sense? That's one color. Resonance, yep, it's resonance. How many, how many resonance structures, right? That's one. What? I'm not, so I'm not counting arrows. One, it's one arrow though, yes. Yeah, which automatically creates new cation. Yes. No, 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 I won't ever go. It won't ever be perfect again. It'll never be perfect. Go there. That goes there now. Yeah. One resonance structure down, right? Okay. Break that. That bond goes there, which moves the plus, minus, plus right there. Does that make sense? Purple makes sense. No, the, 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 we're moving the bond. We don't move the electrons towards the carbon because we have a, we, we want to move the entire, we want to move the entire uh, positive thing. I know it's confusing. There's rules for it, but yeah. If, usually if there's a plot positive, we just move the entire bond. That breaks, that goes down there. That moves a positive there. Does that make sense? Okay. And we got blue. That breaks. That moves the bond. Oh, actually, that's it. That it won't move really, right? Because if I do that, it won't. It won't. Move, it won't touch the. Uh, it won't touch the positive, right? Do you see that? So that's not one, correct? So that doesn't count. So including the original structure, right? The original one, how many isomers did I make? Four, including the original. Include the original. Include the original. Include the original. Include the original. Do you mean you don't get it? Okay. Where? That purple bond, if, if the purple, if the purple bond, if the purple bond were to occur, right, that bond goes there. This guy goes away. Yes. Okay. That's what's going on. Because it takes time. It, it's different steps. It doesn't all occur at once, right? Because it's technically a different molecule, right? Because it's a different name. Because remember IU pack names, right? You have to name where the double bond is located. And since the double bond is moving, each one has its own different name. It's like you get if it's like you if 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 I can't talk. Too much caffeine in my system. It's like you have a it look, it's like you have a different name if you take a piece of clothing off every time. Right? As long as you change your body or you change your way you dress, you have a different name. Best thing I got to. Each time you move on, you count as a different resonance structure. Yes. As it changes structure, you could count just count the number of arrows. That is a possibility too, Mackenzie. Yes. But that would lead you to the thing where you have to include the original structure. Since that's in there, you have to do that. So the answer is four. Cool. 15, 15, 15, okay. Okay. So amines are what? Nitrogen, bonds with that, bonds to whatever the hell it wants to, right? That's an amine. What's an amide? Uh, 
right? Bonded to time technically whatever it wants to, right? Usually, usually another carbon. <clears throat> so which one's more basic? Which one is what you guys think? Which one can do resonance? It might. Yeah, which one can do resonance? Which one can do resonance? Which one has a double bond? No, the the amide has a double bond. That's the amide right here. I don't like the yellow. I don't like the orange really too much. It is more acidic. Because it has a double bond, it has resonance. Resonance makes you more acidic, right? So thus, this guy is more acidic. He's more acidic, he's more acid, which would make that guy the stronger base because it's less acidic, because it doesn't have a resonance structure. Does that make sense? It's more acidic. It's more acidic. It's not an acid. It just because something has a resonance structure, doesn't make it more, it doesn't make it an acid immediately. You have to decide what it's comparing it to. It's a weaker base, yes. But because it has resonance structure, it's more stable, right? Correct? Right? Resonance makes you more stable, right? If you're more stable, are you, you have a higher boiling point or lower boiling point? Higher boiling point. Yes, right? It would have a, the amide would have a higher boiling point. What about the amine? Amine would have lower, right? So amines are stronger bases and have lower boiling points. Read the question very carefully. Amines have, not the amide, the amines have a lower boiling point, which is true, right? And the amines are more basic, right? That makes sense? The way he words, it's very annoying, I agree. I sat there for a minute or two looking, reading the question over and over and over again, after the key. I don't know, because he finds enjoyment in it. Mean old man sometimes. Huh? No, gross. Smith is nice. Connors is nice. It's Grubbs who's the mean man. No, I'm talking about Grubbs. Even though he's not that old. What's up? Yes. Stable. By a higher boiling point, right? Then this, the mean must have a lower boiling point by definition. Yeah. So it's stronger, lower. Cool. Yippity do die, yippity ish. My oh my, it's wonderful. Okay. So look at our pro let's look at our thing in step one. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Right? What's the first thing you notice? I got this thing going on here, right? That's scary. I don't like rings. Guess what Grubbs loves? He likes making rings and breaking rings. He loves it. It's his favorite thing to do. It's very annoying. Loves it. Okay. So, but what do I got right here? I got a little, little tiny bromine right there, right? Where did it come from? Broke off right there, right? So bromine, Walk, get, broke its bond, correct? What's carbon? You got that? You got that? Does that make sense? What? Bromine left, it's a leaving group, right? Thus it breaks its bond, becoming negative. Since bromine left carbon, what did, what did carbon become? A cation or anion? Yep, it lost electrons, it becomes a cation. What also has electrons on this molecule? 
sulfur has two, right? Are those electrons attracted to that cation, yes or no? Yes, they are negative, aren't they? These electrons are attracted to that cation, correct? So what happens is sulfur will bend the entire molecule to get to that cation, and that's how you get structure two. Is it literally folds on itself to get rid of that cation. First one only has two hours so far, but that is only step one. Multiple step ones. Same if there's only one step one. So now it's step two. I got a positive thing. Does sulfur want to be positive? Yes or no? It's electronegative. It does not want to be positive, right? So what happens, it's really stupid that he does this, it breaks the bond just formed. It breaks the bond it just formed. Why? Because it's an intermediate step and it does it sometimes. Because he likes when rings are formed and rings when rings break. So sulfur is positive, it's not happy. So it breaks the bond it bonds to carbon. And then when doing so becomes normal. Well, now I break that bond, that carbon becomes positive again, right? Besides the sulfur, because it's a never ending step, right? Is there anything with lone pairs that could bond to that guy? No, bromine's out of the picture. Bromine's happy. Bromine, it has eight electrons. It would never react to anything ever again. That's added to the structure. Right? So that oxygen has lone pairs on it, right? Which will, ME means uh, amines. So the lone pairs and the oxygen will come towards that positive bond and that's how you get this guy. Making sense so far? It's stupid, I agree, which means it will be most likely on your test. I agree. Now I'm going from this guy right here to this guy, right? And I add that guy and I have this guy as a product as well. So what's the difference between that guy, the two guys I just circled? What's the difference? There is one atom difference. Two things I circled. Which one has one more H? which means I have to give it an H, right? So where's the H come from? Where is an H located in my... So what happens is oxygen is positive. Is that happy? No, it is not, right? Thus, it breaks its bond with... So oxygen breaks its bond with hydrogen, right? Thus becoming normal which makes the hydrogen what? Positive. Thus, the lone pair on the oxygen 
attaches to it. Thus making methyl. ME stands for methyl. It's just a carbon with three hydrogens. He tells you right there. Okay. Most likely because he hasn't he has not referred to it as a methyl group just yet in class. Um, that's what it's called. That's why I keep calling it methyl. It's because that's technically what its name is. It's a methyl group. Okay. How many arrows did I draw? Two, four, six. Six arrows. Each step has three. For each step has two. There's three steps, which means six total. I'm I'm hyper. What? I'm hyper. If I have more, I'm like an hour sleep. I'm on caffeine. So what happens. I'm going well, hopefully I don't crash on the way home. Hopefully I crash when I get home. I way I can wake up like at five o'clock to get to school again. Why? Because I was crashing in my six o'clock class. Why was drinking now? Because I was crashing in my six o'clock class and I can't drink during lab. Yeah. Yeah, little hats. I should just get F and F and pen and just stab myself. Okay. Water, is it polar? Yes. So a thing with charges most likely is very soluble in water because water is polar, right? Thus, polar molecules are soluble in it, right? Does that concept make sense? Yes or no? Because light dissolves light. If that does not make sense, we have to go all the way back to 113 for this. Well, there's a positive and a negative charge, right? There's two charges there. That means that molecule is polar, correct? Thus, it is soluble in water. Yes, why? Why? There's no movement. It's the exact same on three sides, right? So it's getting pulled to three different sides equally, right? Nothing's gonna work. There is no tension on it, theoretically speaking. So it's being pulled equally. It's in, oh, I wouldn't say insoluble, right? Because technically nitrogen is not, it's not insoluble. It's close to being insoluble, right? Less soluble, yep. It's the least soluble. Well, one, because this one has charges. That's the big thing, right? That's the dead giveaway. It has charges, it's polar. It has carbons, right? The larger the, the, larger the chain normally, the least soluble it is, right? The reason being, what's a fat molecule? That's a fat molecule, right? It's a bunch of carbons connected to each other. That's insoluble. So think about the closer you get to a fat molecule, the least soluble you are, right? But if you look at it, this guy and this guy are pretty much exactly the same. The only difference is one has charges, one doesn't have charges, right? Just having charges makes you way more polar because you're now polar by definition. Okay. I'm gonna go a little bit quicker because it's gonna shut off in like a couple seconds. And we're almost done too. Which one is stronger acid? So do they have equal do they, do they have equal do they have equal resonance structure? Yes or no? Yes. Because they're pretty much the same molecule, right? The only difference, right, is what? Placement of the bones. All right.
very, very annoying. But because these are very similar to each other, I only care about that. So if I'm just keeping around those two, right? Pretty much exactly the same. It's one difference though. Mm -hmm. That's where hybridization matters is when, hybridization only matters when atoms don't matter and there's no resonance. That's what hybrid, that's what hybridization comes in. So which one has more S characteristics? One or two? One, because the conjugate base is more stable. Yes, they do. It does. It's the placement hybridization that actually matters too. So, S P. Let's get right here. What? S P. Two things, right? S P. That guy right there. S P three. S P three. So you guys should not be doing this, but. When you guys graduate from GC and you go to the bar to pick up chicks or guys, right? Uh, is it easier to pick up the person in the middle of the group or at the end of the group? The end of the group, right? Because it's easier to pick them away and move them away from the group, right? Because the SP characteristics are in the middle, flanked by two SP3s, it doesn't matter. It's more stable, but because I have so many SP characteristics towards one end, right? It's more reactive towards one end. Pick up, you just put bars, pick up, pick up bars. Basically, yes, if it's on the end, it's more acidic, it's more reactive. That's it. No, seriously. If you'll learn this concept and further things, this concept is actually testing me has not learned yet. Because it's grubs, because technically it would mention in a footnote in one of the chapters, most likely. Well, stronger acids are found on the outsides. CH bonds are not weaker, right? It's exact, it's CH bonds are always the same. Because the conjugate base is stabilized by a positive nucleus. So, if this H were to disappear, right? This triple bond theoretically stabilizes it, right? because it's next to a true bond. That's what it means. Because it's a positive bond next to a true bond, which stabilizes it because why, Athena? What does a double bond have access to? It has access to lone pairs, electrons, right? So it can readily give up its electrons to make that positive go away if it wanted to. That stabilizes it, right? That's why. But again, you guys should not understand my analogy because you guys don't go to GCU and you don't drink. Whoa, but you are on a dry campus and you don't go partying. Well, you can, but you're not, you're, you can get, you just don't want to because it can look bad if you are an athlete or an RA. See, it doesn't look bad. See, to get drunk, uh, to get drunk and then be found out about it. You're a life leader, it's bad. 
get this as an example of GCU standards. Yeah. Even if you're of, of age, it's it's frowned upon. You get a talking to, and it happens again. They get another talking to, and then three strikes. Yeah. Yeah. See. Cool. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So. Do we use Bronson, Lowry, and Ochem? There we go. Half the answers are gone. Okay. And is it? Why? Good job. Yay. That pops up in test. You guys will get the answer right. Moving on. This guy right here. Yeah. It most like it could. I don't know if that one exactly will be, but one like they'll be asked. Cool. And here is where I stop because students start to ask me questions about kinetics. Because someone almost drank the purple stuff. Crystal violet. Someone wanted to. I had to stop immediately. Go talk to them. Because it looked purple. It looked like Kool Aid. Like no, do not do that. It'll be cancer. How? I don't know, because high school is a joke. Okay. So with this, you are counting the carbons and hydrogens. Do we really have to do this? You guys can count carbons and hydrogens, right? The X are carbons, Ys are hydrogens. Yes, I'm going to. There are 17 carbons and 13 hydrogens. Cool. I know we have four more questions. They're not that bad. <clears throat> okay. Conjugate base. Which one's the original base? So that is the base. Yep. Cool. Rank the acidity of the protons. Okay. Which one is the most acidic? So which one is closest to the most resonant structures, the most double bonds? One, two, or three? You got bonds there and bonds there, right? It's flanked by two double bonds, right? It's near the most resonant structures. Thus, it is the most acidic. Two is flanked by two, right? So that's the technically the most. That's, a, that's, a, that's the lead, sorry, that's the middle. Two is middle. Technically, yes, and also it's not, it's the reason also why it's not as close to an oxygen, which is more electronegative. And lastly, three, it's only next to one double bond, which makes it the least. And yes, that also works too, yes. Rank the formal formulas based upon structural isomer possibilities. Okay. So we have that nitrogen right there. That's kind of special, right? Let's draw this out real quick. I'll draw one, and I'll draw, right? Technically, I'll give you the answer real quick. Technically, it's Three, two, one, and I'll show you why. I have three carbons, right? One, two, three. One, two, three. 
nitrogen, double bond, right? And then it has one H. That's double, sorry, I messed up, but that is a double. So that is one of the isomers for 23, right? It has to have a double bond, right? And it has to have a nitrogen. Could you move that guy around a lot, right? I can move the double bond to a different guy, and I can move the nitrogen to another guy. You see all the possibilities? Or just, move the, just, just move the nitrogen itself has lots of possibilities, right? But also just moving the double bond also has lots of possibilities, right? There's two things to move, correct? Lots of possibilities. I can move the location of the double bond, and I, or I can move the location of the nitrogen. Kind of, no, because there's, so, there's only there's so few, I can't make branches and I can't make rings. Okay, then if there's a memorize it, memorize it. I'm just telling you how I would approach it. The middle one is two because it's so many carbons, right? You can make rings and you can make branches and all those weird shapes, right? That's the least few because you lose this double bond right here, right? You lose that double bond, which significantly lowers the low limits the number of possibilities you can have, right? Does it make sense? I went from a whole bunch to two. I have it in the end, or have it in the middle, that's it. Does that make sense? That's why that one is so few. That's how I would approach this one without doing it. If you can't see that, that's okay. I would do this one first and just draw them all out. Make sense? Yeah. Look formula has how many carboxylic acid structures possible? Hey, carboxylic acid, what's the, what's the formal structure? R, C, double bond, O, O, H. Where can this guy be found? Has to be found on a, has to be found on a primary carbon. Has to be near the end of something. Do you see that? Because it has one R group. Two, three, four, five. Let's do it the easy one. That's one, three, that's uh, five, six, seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go. Correct? I can't put it on this guy because it's exactly the same molecule, right? So, what do I have to do? I have to branch out or make some branches, right? So I could do this, right? And then do that, correct? That's one possibility. And I get three, three, three. But that's it, because I put that carboxylic acid on any of these carbons, it's exactly the same thing, right? It's just, move, I just tilted it basically. I just rotated the molecule. Do you see that? Yes or no? If I were to put this carboxylic acid on any of the other terminal carbons, it's pretty much the exact same thing. Okay, that means I'm done there. I could do this, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I put, I put one, 20 carbons. There you go. Get the point though, right? Cool. Okay. And then I could just move this guy over one. It's an entirely different molecule, right? So the answer is, four. That's how I would approach this problem. So it tells me I have a carboxylic acid. I know I need to put it to the end. That limits the number of resonance structures I have. Okay. What is molecular geometry for any carbon in a aryl ring? Uh-oh, what's that mean? Huh? A benzene ring? You're right. So here's my benzene ring. 
what is the hybridization of every single carbon? SP2. SP2 is what shape? Trigger to planar. So everyone is trigeminal planar. Ta da! Yep. SP is linear, tetrahedral, SP3. Bent is not that. Bent has to be linear, not bent, literally. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Zoomies. Any questions before I have to log off, before it shuts me out? Oh, thank you, Shane. Okay. I will. Uh, thank you. I most likely will start earlier because there's more questions. Same place. Same place. Thank you. See ya, see ya. Bye, Shane. Thank you. I'm going to end the call because I have to uh, start recording my thing. Okay, bye. Bye. What? You guys should only be learning like uh, the basic stuff.